So if you were paying attention during the World Cup, I started showing the team maps to better explain what teams actually do on the field. And it was something I first worked on ages ago when someone at the last minute asked me to come in and do a bunch of PSL work. I didn't really understand what the teams were about at that stage. So I devised this plan so I could instantly work out where a team was good and not good. They look at the six different sections of the game, uh, power play, middle and death. And then of course they're split up by batting and bowling. It's kind of a sex top mat. I'm not sure I could sell that, but I'm trying to. The numbers themselves are not averages or strike rates. They're just like a combination of both. And you can see here from the average one that this is what it would look like if you're equally good at everything. And then you can start to see the sort of weird shapes that individual teams do. Hello Delhi and their incredible death batting average, for instance. And KKR has kind of invented a shape that no longer existed. And I think Roger Sumrall's have a very pleasing shape when you look at it, but you can see just how different all of these are. And essentially the best way of reading these maps is on the right hand side is batting. So you want your shape to be as pushed out as far as possible. And on the left hand side is bowling and you want it to be in as much as possible. And this is what the individual shapes all look like. So you can get a quick look at that, but also we can do something fun with it. We can bring them all together and mash them all up. And this is a little bit more confusing, of course, but you can see, you know, just little bits of teams poking up there's the capitals death batting average again hello and what have we got down here rcb in the power play bowling not so good and then up to here we have the royals uh batting average in the power play thank you joss butler now all of these different marks here they're not really averages or strike rates they're more like a rating system based on all that but it's pretty much the same thing but in order to make it so that it actually came out to average I had to play around with things a little bit. But essentially what you're trying to do really with this kind of map is to say whether this team is better or worse on average in this section of the game. So that's all we really need to know from the numbers. Last season I was planning all of these for my exit interview series. Unfortunately, uh, there was too much cricket as there quite often is and I never got around to doing all the videos that I wanted to. But with the auction just happening, I was like, well, oh, why don't I just use this and almost combine the information that we learned at the auction with how they played last year. And for the order, I thought the best thing to do is just go from the bottom of the table all the way through to the top of the table. So that means that we have to, you know, get rid of some of these teams for a minute, shall we? And there's Mumbai. In fact, there's Mumbai. In this auction, they spent almost all of their money on one player, Cameron Green. So how you feel about them will probably depend on your thoughts on him as well. I think he's a fairly untested player with obviously tremendous, huge upside. But he was certainly paid more than he's currently worth. I've talked about this a lot before, but essentially you're paying nearly $2 million for a guy who has played two good T20 innings uh, and also bowled about 22 overs in his career. So you're paying almost $100,000 per over. And when he does bowl for Australia, he's been going at over nine and over. Now, I do believe that his batting should translate. If not now, then at least eventually. But in this IPL, if he averages over 25, considering the price, it's as big a leap of faith as we have seen so far in the IPL. But if you look at Mumbai in the power play, they had a decent batting average, but they do slip off a little bit when it comes to economy, just slightly under average. Part of that is because Rohit Sharma faced 183 balls and made 227 runs. Now, they aren't about to dump him. So Green, if he opened, which is the only place he's really looked like a T20 player so far, he would be given free reign at the top. But he obviously may not open because Ishan Kishan could end up there again. He was actually pretty slow last year as well. In fact, the year before, he wasn't that much better. It was 2020. It was the last year that Ishan Kishan had a really plus IPL season. So there is an opportunity there to actually open with green and maybe push Ishan down to number three or even number four. The middle might well be green. You can see that certainly need something in there. They're struggling when it comes to losing wickets and also doing it quite slowly. I would assume that Sky either stays at three or moves down to four. And so then you have Tilik Varma, either Brevis or Stubbs and Tim David. It's not that deep or experienced, but it's hella explosive and it should also help them at the end. You could see that last time, probably partly down to Tim David, they do have a bit of a death spike, even if they kept losing a lot of wickets there. So let's move on to the bowling. You can see that they took an absolute buttload of wickets in the power play. However, as is often the case, that was pretty much all two players. Jasper Bumra, which should hold up year on year as long as he's fit, and Daniel Sams, who is now gone. So Jofra Archer will be taking those over, so that should be fine. Of course, it does weaken the batting a little bit, even if Sams is very miss or hit with the bat. In a perfect world, Green would step up with the ball, and the best place to use him at the moment for Mumbai would be in the middle. 
you can see that they're not taking wickets at the middle and it's really hurting them when it comes to runs per over as well. There is an opportunity for Mumbai to just juice up the wickets if Bumrah, Jofra and Green are all fit and just make sure that it helps seam bowlers. Pace and bounce. And they might have to do that because they don't really have a frontline spinner. Who's the best spinner in their squad? Is it Piers Chawla? Murugan Ashwin played okay for them in limited games last season and he's off to the Royals and they've replaced him with either untested players or Chawla who played one game in the last two years and that game did not go particularly well and his last plus season was probably 2016. If you look at the death they did really well last year and if you put Jofra Archer into that that should get even better although I do think they need one really good young Indian quick but to be honest Overall, I don't really understand Mumbai's overall team right at the moment. They have no go-to spinner. Their second best Indian team would appear to be Akash Madhwa, who has not played. They're basically betting all of their improvement on Jofra's health and Green's bowling. And their seam bowling would appear to be overseas or bust, meaning that they can't use as many international batters. But they also don't... So that's now expecting a lot out of their locals. The truth is, though, this still doesn't look like a Mumbai team set up for this season. They might have more success just because they have more players available, but it does feel like they are actually building something for the future. You know, Jasprit, Jofra, Green, Brevis, Stubbs, Ishan, Sky. And as you may have heard me say to Parrot recently, it's almost as if they realize they're going to be able to keep more players when the next mega auction comes around. I have no idea how they're going to play this year, but whatever they do with the squad they have, there's a lot of talent there that'll be fun to watch. So if we get rid of Mumbai here, we can move on to the Chennai Super Kings. So a fun fact about them, nine players actually appeared in the power play with the bat for them, including Mitchell Santner, twice. It was all happening for them at the top, and none of that was particularly good. As you can see here, they lost a lot of wickets, and they didn't particularly score that quickly either. So does that mean that we get Ben Stokes straight up the order, which is probably his best batting spot in T20 cricket? I mean, this is a team that desperately needs stability at the top. We know that because they picked Rahane, if that's what he even still provides. My guess is that Stokes will bat at three and they'll use Conway as an opener, which again is a fine combination. If Stokes' best spot is opening, his second best spot is probably batting at number three and then floating down the order when you can use your hitters. And then on certain days, allowing him to float down the order when you want to use your hitters. After those bad starts for Chennai, you can see that they fought back pretty well there in the middle. Really good batting average and the strike rate not too bad either. A lot of that was Shivan Dubey, who really stepped up after years of being talked up. The fact that they didn't lose wickets while still scoring quickly kind of made up for those slower starts. And you would think that maybe they had overcome the early wickets when it came to the death. That was not the case though. You can see here that they continue to lose a lot of wickets at the death and they're just a little bit slower than average there as well. I did look at Dhoni's numbers by the way at the death and they were completely fine. With the ball, they couldn't take that many wickets up the top, but they're also not particularly bad. But the bowling economy didn't hold up as well as they wanted. That's probably why they've gone and got Kyle Jameson in what is, I suppose, a bit of a fire sale. I thought it was very optimistic when he was picked up at the RCB and that they thought he was the missing link. Probably seen him play more T20 cricket than most, and he hasn't quite developed his game in that way yet. But he still has basic skills that should work really well in T20 cricket. As in, he can swing the ball both ways. And it's something that we haven't seen. So perhaps if Jameson is used in that sort of role, rather than towards the back end of the power play, and they can literally just say to him, ball and out swinger, ball and in swinger, ball and out swinger, ball and in swinger. Maybe that will end up being a really good buy. You could see that they had a really good series when it came to the middle overs last time. And that makes a lot of sense. You know, Tikshana, Moeen, and Jadeja, those are all pretty good and obviously very different kinds of spin bowling options. There's nothing that would surprise you about a Chennai side about them being good here because they've kind of always been good at this. They trust finger spin more than anything else. They quite often make sure that their pitches help it as well. And the fact that they have all round options and even Tikshana can bowl with a new ball when he needs to just gives them a lot of variability. Even though they have three finger spinners, they're all completely different in every way and they can be used at different parts of the game. It all kind of fell away a bit at the death though. You could see that they're just didn't take any wickets at all. The bowling economy is, I think that's about as bad as you will see. They really let that go. And the problem with these numbers are that Dwayne Bravo was absolutely incredible at the death for them. And this still happened. His retirement is just going to hurt them, especially considering just how much everyone else got hammered. And Bravo's replacement, I suppose, is Stokes. But Stokes is not a particularly good death bowler. Please see Carlos Brathwaite. But Chennai have been pretty good at getting the most out of all-rounders more often than not. So I expect to see Stokes as a, I don't know, finger spinner in the middle overs, probably. 
All right, so these are the bottom two teams from last time. And uh, in some ways, they haven't made the kind of bold decisions that you might expect teams like that to make. But to be fair, they're also the two most successful teams in the IPL. So if you're going to back anyone, you'd back them. We'll be back tomorrow for the next two teams, which is the Sunrisers and KKR.